take it away. Let's start. Thank start you so time. much. Um, I am just really, really honored to be joining y'all today. Thank you for this opportunity. I um, have been working in education for a long, long time, and in particular, special education. I um, have a sibling that uh, would have been in special education had we had it back in that day, um, but we didn't have the particular label that he had, and that really motivated me to um, pursue this career. Um, I started out in elementary school um, teaching uh, self-contained, we called it something different then um, that we don't say anymore, begins mm -hmm. with an R. Um, and um, I taught that for about six years. And then because I didn't have the, the proper uh, documentation to punish me, they sent me to the high school. And I thought that was going to be such a terrible thing. But I fell in love with it because mm -hmm. that's where I got to work in transition. And that was the best thing that could have ever happened because students that are looking at the reality of transition get really serious. They get mm -hmm. serious about what they're going to do. They get serious about what they're interested in. And they get serious about what they need to learn. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with the, um, the process. I fell in love with the problem solving around that. And that's where I, I have been ever since. Um, I got to work in that space for the rest of my career in education. Um, after I left the public school um, and retired from there, I got to work in an inclusive post-secondary setting at Kennesaw State University for several years. Um, then I worked in a state agency, the Vocational Rehabilitation Agency in our state uh, for a couple of years as the statewide transition coordinator. And uh, now I'm at the Autism Center at Emory University, um, supporting families and self-advocates in their transition journey. So um, all the time doing the thing I love, and um, but doing it in a different way every time. So, so great. And they say when you when you're doing what you love, you're it's not like working at all. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I should have known we had something in common. I also grew up with a boy who, who kind of raised his my, my close cousin, but he also did not have one half hour of education back in the day. Nonverbal mm -hmm. cerebral palsy. Um, mo just like yep. And I believe on the spectrum, just from what I know now that, but they didn't even know what that was at that time, but yeah. And, um, and he understood English and Spanish perfectly. Oh, wow. but, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Same. Yeah. all right. I'm going to go ahead and put my picture off and then I'm going to mute myself and you've got control over the mouse there, Carla. If you need us, we're right here. We'll see you in a little bit. Tell us. What you're going to I will dive in. Well, I think I'll dive in. I have the mouse and I'm clicking. Oh, maybe, ah, there we go. Ah, so I'm gonna talk about um, strategies for success in career education and transition for students with ASD. Um, I am with Emory uh, Autism Center. And today we're gonna talk about uh, just a few things. One thing is foundations of career education for students with autism. And when I say students with autism, I'm talking about all of those neurodiverse umbrella things, autism, neurodiversity, ADD, ADHD, anxiety, all of those spectrumy things. I'm gonna talk about those four major barriers to career success and to be very frank with you, barriers to success in anything that we find in the neurodiverse population. Then we'll take a little bit of a deeper dive into those success strategies in each of those four uh, barrier, barrier areas. And then we're gonna talk about leveraging those strategies into the academic day. 
and we'll end up with um, some must-haves for effective planning. So to start off, let's talk about those foundations of career education for students with autism and neuro neurodiverse abilities. The first thing is that real is better. It is really, really difficult for the neurodiverse population to imagine themselves when you're giving them a pretend situation, when you're trying to get them to imagine something via a worksheet, when you're trying to get them to think of a situation through a conversation, having actual objects, having actual um, actions, and being in the milieu, in this situation is really the best way to have that person experience learning in that situation. Neurodiverse people need to see themselves there. They need to see themselves in the situation. They need to see themselves doing it. If you've worked with neurodiverse folks for a while, you'll notice that if you ask them if they would like to do something, their first response will usually be, no, no, I would not. <laughs> nope, I don't want to do that. Why? Maybe because they can't see themselves doing it. They can't see themselves going out there and doing that, choosing that color, doing that art project, doing that career. They can't see themselves doing that. So they're not going to choose it, but they don't know if they would like it or not. So they have to experience it. They have to go through the motions, hold the actual objects, try it for a little bit. They have to see themselves there. And quite often, it is not that they are lacking the skills to do the job. They're experiencing sensitivities that would keep them from being successful. Sensitivities to sometimes the environment, sensitivities to sometimes social situations, sensitivities sometimes to just the requirements of doing things in a certain order or at a certain speed. But quite often, it's not the skills, it's the sensitivities. So keeping that kind of foundation triangle in mind, let's talk about some of those challenges, those barriers to career success. When I work with teachers talking about barriers to learning in the classroom, when I talk to employers about barriers to success on the workplace. When I talk to parents about barriers to success in the community and even at home, I often find that they fall into one of these four buckets, these four categories. And if we as educators can touch on most of these four categories in a day, a week, a semester, I feel like we've done a good job. The first one's executive functioning, that organizing my life, um, getting getting my, my work turned in, getting my things done. We'll, we'll go into this a little bit deeper in a minute. Um, those, those things that keep me moving forward in life, that's a, that's a challenge social skills, interacting with all these other people on the planet. Um, and now that we have that uh, virtual connectivity, that's a challenge too. Um, daily living skills, just getting all of those pieces together, getting my teeth brushed, getting my hair combed, um, doing that in a, a timely manner, uh, matching my socks, um, to my shoes? Am I wearing the right kind of socks for these shoes? Am I ever wearing socks at all? 
Um, are they the wrong kind of socks with the pants I'm wearing? Um, all of those daily living skills. Can I, can I cook? If I can cook, can I manage to shop for all the things I need to cook the thing I wanted to cook today? And then self-awareness, that self-awareness, self-advocacy piece. Do I know enough about myself to know how I need to conduct myself to do all these other things? Those four areas are the four areas that we most commonly see as barriers to success in any of those areas. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the executive functioning skills. What do we mean by that? Task initiation, it, one really, really critical piece. So often we have that paralysis of, I just don't even know where to start. I don't even know where to begin. And, and I don't even know how to begin because I have so many other things I need to do too, which really is linked to the one right below it, planning and prioritizing. What do I need to do first? What's the most important thing I could do? Or what's the thing I need to do before I do the next thing? Which goes into, back up to the top line, to the right problem solving. What needs to be first? What needs to come next? Which is the most important? important thing to come next after the first thing. Um, what kind of resources do I need to have before I do the thing? Um, all of those pieces are super necessary for that. But what if all of those pieces or some of those resources aren't available? Or they won't be here until next Tuesday? Well, that's where the flexible thinking comes in. But what if that makes me upset and sad and dysregulated? That's where the emotional control comes in. And then what if that makes me forget my password? <laughs> that's where the working memory comes in. Um, and that's, that's my biggest challenge, I'll, I will tell y'all. Impulse control. What if that just makes me want to stress eat? And then, <laughs> um, and then what if... That makes me just lose my focus at all. What was I supposed to be remembering? Oh yeah, how to get started. So all of those executive functioning skills, those life um, ways to just move forward, live my life. We'll talk in a little bit about um, different ways to address these and some strategies to be successful in these, but um, uh oh, first, let's talk about social skills. So social skills, one of the challenges, greetings, just that awkward first hello piece, that awkward, I, I, I want to introduce myself. I don't know if I should be formal, if I should interrupt the conversation, how I need to do that, how long I need to shake hands, if I need to shake hands at all. Should I call on the phone? Do I need a script? Will I forget what I'm going to say? Accepting criticism, so difficult, so difficult. Can I accept criticism without having a meltdown? Can I handle conflict? Can I compromise? Can I um, talk to somebody uh, without having, a, uh, having to be right all the time? conversation skills. Can I speak with somebody and alternate questions about a topic that is not about my special interest topic? Can I ask them questions about their special interest topic? Can I ask a follow-up question about that? Perspective taking. Can I see something from another person's point of view. Figurative language. If somebody says it's raining cats and dogs, can I refrain from arguing with them and telling them it is not raining cats and dogs? And then recognizing social cues. 
if I come up and start talking to somebody, can I tell when they don't want to talk to me anymore? So those are some challenges. Self-determination. So uh, what that looks like, um, being able to make choices, being able to solve problems. Now, some of these you'll see in more than one place. Being able to set goals, being able to self-regulate. I believe we saw that under executive functioning too. Knowing about yourself, self-efficacy, having that feeling of I'm in control. I can make my own decisions. Self-advocacy, being able to speak up for yourself because you know yourself. And then those daily living skills like money management. Can I get some money and not spend it all at once on jelly beans because it is Easter and I saw them in the Walmart and I need all the jelly beans because they're Starburst jelly beans and they're the best jelly beans ever and not have any money left over to buy groceries for the rest of the month. What about those cooking skills? Can I cook something besides Kraft macaroni and cheese um, and I have other things that I'm going to be able to eat and actually cook them? Um, can I cook a variety of things? Can I, do I have the uh, courage to do it, to practice them? Uh, can I clean my household, do I know what needs to be clean? Daily hygiene, do I, do I know the steps and will I do them independently without being reminded and reminded and reminded? Uh, maintenance, do I know what needs to be fixed? Do I know how to fix it? Do I know how to look at a schedule of when to change the air filters in my um, air conditioning? Um, that laundry piece, dressing myself, and then uh, keeping up with my health and wellness, when to take that medication, when to uh, take my vitamins, when to go to the doctor. Those pieces, critical. So we've talked about what those look like, those four areas. Let's talk a little bit about strategies to support. And I'm not going to read every single one to you because I have a lot of strategies here. Um, this presentation is being recorded, so you can have it. You can go back and you can see it. But I will highlight some of my favorites for you. Um, and in, self, um, in, in supporting executive functioning, you remember executive functioning was that, you know, getting through the day, getting yourself organized to be able to uh, move forward. I love a checklist. I love uh, our students having a checklist. That takes away the problem of having that verbal reminder. And if you are a parent of a neurodiverse child, a verbal reminder is often called nagging. So that takes away that problem. If there's a checklist, then it can be the checklist fault that, that uh, there's a continual reminder. The checklist can go on the refrigerator. The checklist can be on their smartphone. The checklist can be there, not from you. Um, and that, so that's a great thing, using a checklist to know what's next, to, to keep up with all the steps. Um, all of those pieces. There's a fabulous um, app called goblin.tools that will create a checklist. In the old days, we special ed teachers would call it a task analysis, but now they just call it a checklist. Um, it's called goblin.tools and it will create a checklist. You just put in, how do I brush my teeth? And it'll make a checklist for you. If you don't understand one of the steps, you can click on it and it'll break down the steps for you. 
Um, if you say how to make an apple pie, it will do the, the, the steps for you. If you, it's, if you put in, how do I change the oil in my car? It will do the steps for you. Um, so that, that's a great resource that I really like. Um, I, I love checklists. I love, um, modeling the uh, model setting goals and list steps to achieve those goals that um metacognition piece that um working with students if you or 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 your own children um if you're talking through what you do okay i am a little bit upset and so i'm going to take five deep breaths because that calms me down so I'm taking five deep breaths now, and then I'm going to write down three steps that I am going to take to find my keys, because that's what I'm upset about is I've lost my keys. So if you talk through it, that, that model setting goals, that metacognition piece, um, I'm modeling what I'm doing. And then the next time that comes up, you know, they, and they're uh, becoming uh, dysregulated. Uh, remember how I took five breaths and then wrote down my steps. I want you to try that. They've seen it. Now you're going to ask them to do it. So, so those are a couple of things that I, I suggest. I do like a planner. Um, just, oh, I went backwards. All right. All right, moving on to um, strategies for social skills. Uh, the strategies for developing social skills are get social, go <laughs> and get social, volunteer, um, get out there, get some experiences, join a club, um, go to a sports event, go to camp, um, go to... Um, a, an open house event. Um, I'm mentioning modeling and that every time you see modeling, think that I'm saying metacognition. You're showing them how to do it. Model conflict resolution. Sorry, Sorry. that's my office manager, um, <laughs> McAllister. Um, modeling conflict resolution. You're going to Stop. If there's a conflict coming up, you're going to say, okay, we have a conflict here. I'm going to model how to resolve this conflict. And you're going to stop. You're going to talk about the steps that you're um, going through. And then you're going to invite them to do the steps with you. I'm going to take a deep breath because I'm getting emotional. And then I'm going to try to see this from another person's point of view and then I'm going to try to come to a compromise. And that means um, what, um, uh, what the other person would like, some of what they would like, and some of what I would like. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And then <laughs> um, asking for needed accommodations. Big, 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 important piece that is very important being out in the community, being out in the club, being out in the sporting event, event, being out volunteering at a business. That's where you can ask for the accommodation. Hey, um, this light is really bothering me. Is there any way that we cannot have an overhead light on all the time? Um, Maybe or maybe not, but that's a way to practice asking for accommodations. And the last super important piece I want to um, promote um, is the possibility of using social stories. And I've added situation cards. Um, and I believe it is true that um, education associates in the discovery, a uh, project discovery piece some situation cards um, that they use in, in that piece of the, um, the curriculum. Is that still true, Lisa? 
Yes, it's true. We have okay. situation cards. We also we, role playing is really what we call it in the kits. And we have some role playing that's provided for you. But we also encourage students to come up with their own role play and to work that out that way. Thank you for confirming that. Um, yep. So, so uh, one piece of my history that that I'm super super proud of is I got to be an early contributor to this curriculum, and um, I did some work on the situation cards. So, um, years and years ago. So, super excited that that those are there. I absolutely uh, recommend using those kind of things. They're really short. Um, really to the point. It's, it's not it's not Shakespeare. It's just a really short little um, uh, role play situation where you ask them, okay, here's the, here's what's going on. What would you do? What should you do? Here, here's what's going on. Let's think about it. Um, I, I really recommend um, doing that. Now, earlier I said, it's really hard for kids with uh, autism and neurodiversity to imagine themselves somewhere else. So I recommend that you take those out after they have been in a situation like this. So give them the opportunity to be out in the community, to have a conflict, to be um, volunteering, to do the situation, to try asking for an accommodation, and then come back together and say, okay, let's debrief. What would you do if, here's a situation card. Um, and then those strategies for self-determination. Oh, please support choice making. Please don't make all their choices for them. Some choices are choices that they can make. Um, some choices are choices that are fine for them to make and, and, and really won't bring the world to a halt if they make their own choices there. Um, setting goals, um, being able to um, participate in the IEP process, that's all full of goals. It's nothing but goals. Have them uh, participate in that for sure. Um, I put um, volunteer positions here as well because that's a great place to develop those uh, self-determination skills. And then, and my favorite one here is value the dignity of risk. Our students need to risk things. They need, and hear me when I say this, with love in my heart, they need to fail. They need to have the opportunity to fail. And what better place for them to fail than the safe place that we're providing them as teachers, as parents, as people that love and care about them, so that they can learn from that experience so that we can say, oh, that did not work out the way you wanted it to. What would you like to do differently next time so that you can have the outcome you want? I call that a feather bed failure. This is the place for them to have a feather bed failure so that they can learn from it, get up, you don't want them to have the experience that the first time they ever fail is when they're out there in the cold, cruel world and you're not there to support them. So value the dignity of risk and let them fail now. And then teach them resilience so that they can be resilient when they get out there. Help your student know his or her disability. I can't tell you how many times parents have come to me and said, my, my child doesn't know they're disabled. They cannot advocate for themselves if they don't know they are disabled. And when they go off to college, when they go off to work, when they go off into the community anywhere, and they don't know 
that they have a disability, they cannot ask for an accommodation. They need to know, they have a right to know, please help give them the language so that they can know, so that they can ask, so that they can speak for themselves in the appropriate way. And this piece is huge. Setting up a doctor's appointment. Um, at some point, the young people that are making the transition from youth to adulthood are going to have to move from being served by a pediatric uh, practice to being served by an adult medical practice. So they're going to have to go to an adult doctor. I love when schools, when parents, when organizations help students set up their own doctor's appointments because that's what grownups do. So often this requires a script. Um, with our more verbal students, they can do it if they have a script to work from. Um, but using a script gives them the, the um, confidence to know, know what to say and what's coming up. Uh, back in the day when I was still working at a school building, we got our secretary to help us practice. We would back. This was so long ago. There were pay phones. We would go, we would go to a pay phone, and, and every student had a quarter. And they would put in a quarter. And they would call the secretary, and they would practice talking to her, as if they were making an appointment. I bet that teachers here have some trusted adult that they can get on a cell phone, and have the talk to a student, and role play, making an appointment. Practice that over and over and over. Be consistent, practice that over and over and over. Um, and then with family's help, move to actually calling the doctor and making an appointment. All right, zooming forward, uh, strategies to support those daily living skills. Look. There's the checklist again. I really like checklist. Building transportation skills. I love, love, love places where there's public transportation. Where I live, there's not any. We could have it. We just don't. Um, so it's Uber or Lyft where we are. Um, so that's, that's what it's going to have to be. And so we'll have to teach students to use that app and to know that when that little car comes, it means that they've got to go outside and get in it. Um, setting alarms, setting alarms and knowing that when that alarm rings, they've got to do the thing and then keeping up with the thing that they were going to do. Um, I do love smartphones for all kinds of management. Um, one of the uh, daily living skills that I didn't put on here is medication management. Um, I have an app, I believe it's called MediSafe, M-E-D-I-S-A-F-E. -E. Um, and I'm at that special age where I've got about a billion pills that I take at different times of the day. And I can put in this app all of my pills. I can have different alarms for when I'm supposed to take them. And I can share that information with my daughters so they know if I'm taking them too. Imagine, same thing can happen with um, your students and their parents. Everybody can know when the med medicine is supposed to be taken, if they took it or not, and then you know what's, what's going on there. The other piece is that it's not just an alarm that goes off. I can have fun voices remind me. I can have Mickey Mouse. I think I can have Gandalf tell me. I can have uh, Darth Vader can tell me. I, I would I would really take it if Darth Vader 
told me to take it. Um, so, th you know, those are pieces that um, just, just really make life easier, more fun. Um, all of those pieces uh, are available, are there. Definitely would use those strategies. So lever, oh. Almost done. So leveraging those strategies. Um, be sure you're working with those discrete outcomes and hands-on activities. Make sure that your students know what you're asking of them, what you want the outcome to be, where you're headed, what you want them to do, and then provide them with those hands-on activities. What they're, what they're able to do and make sure they're consistent, especially with the students who require more supports. Give them the same things to do over and over. Sometimes uh, at, part of my job at one point in time was a community-based job trainer. So we would take students out to places um, for instance, I went to the Target um, stock room for many, many years. I had uh, many students and we would train in the Target stock room. And our best job in the world was um, shoes. We would take the shoes as they come in. We would take them out of the box and we take all the tissue and sticks and stuff out of them and put them back in the box, heel to toe. And this was a great job because it was the same thing. There were always some kind of shoes in that box. And there was always the same kind of stuff in it, tissue. Um, and we were always doing the same task, taking them out, cleaning them, putting them back in. But there was enough variety. There were brown shoes and there were key heels and there were sneakers and there were, you know, flats and there were boots and there were all kinds of different shoes, but they were always shoes. Um, the managers were very impressed with our work and they wanted to come and let us go over to Spring Goods and try that because they were afraid we were bored. And I said, no, 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 we're very happy. <laughs> Please leave us here in the shoes because that was a consistent job, a consistent task. We were that, that we were getting independent. We had a rhythm. We were that's what we needed. We needed that consistent system um, because that was allowing us to build those work skills, be able to work on those social skills, uh, be that kind of worker that was confident, that knew what we did and where we were. And, and I'm not talking about students that needed less support. These students needed a significant amount of support. Um, they let us uh, continue that for a, a good long time. Um, and then they stopped doing shoes that way. But that's that's the, the real world, world. That's real life. Um, use those checklists. Use those calendars. Use those, um, those good teaching uh, pieces that you know. I want to mention something about backwards chaining, especially for... Um, our students with autism that require more supports. Backwards chaining is when you start at the end and then you add a step towards the beginning every time. For instance, if, you, if you're teaching them to do laundry, then you start at the end. Starting at the end is I give you your folded laundry and your job is to put it up. And then when you get good at that, I give you your unfolded laundry, teach you to fold it, and you put it up. And then I have you take it out of the dryer, teach you to fold it, and put it up. You see how I'm going backwards? Why? Because if I start from the beginning and have you separate, you know, whites and darks and the it's so long till you get to the finish. It's so long until you get to the part where you can put away your laundry and have, have that finished and, 
and enjoy the finished project. And if, if we start from the end, you get to celebrate being finished and having that, that finished piece first. So consider what task you can do that you can start with backwards chaining. So that, that's what I recommend. And then the other piece, and this is especially for those students that require less supports, coaching in those setting priorities, building schedules, initiating tasks, um, those, those pieces that stand in the way of how am I going to be successful in the office? How am I going to be successful in college? How am I going to be successful out in the workplace? And so here are some must-haves. Um, presume that the student will participate and then figure out how. How often have you been in a planning um, or strategic session and heard someone say, oh, she can't do that. She can't do that. She can't, she can't come to chemistry class. She, she can't understand that stuff. No, no, no. We're gonna have inclusion. How is she gonna participate? Make sure that every student's voice is included in every decision. How would you like to participate, Fred? Would you like to participate by making a PowerPoint or would you like to participate by building a model? Which way would you like to participate? And then be ready for that out of the box thinking. You know, in special education, those students are eligible until they're 22. Lots of school districts are adding programs for that 18 to 22 age range. They're uh, including internships. They're adding in dual enrollment. They're creating a supportive community um, that includes transitioning to uh, jobs that's pulling in agencies like vocational rehabilitation and goodwill and uh, DBHDD and all of those different agencies that can support. And I believe this is my last slide. Um, I discovered this proverb a long time ago, prepare the child for the path, not the path for the child. There is my email. Um, it's my first initial K, my last name Wade, like Wade in the water, and the number nine, almost my shoe size, at emory.edu. Please email me. Uh, we offer technical assistance. We offer uh, all kinds of support. Uh, we have some resources on our website. And um, definitely, definitely, definitely check out Education Associates Projects. Oh my god. Are there any questions? Yeah, there's just a couple, but oh my goodness, the first thing I have to do is just applaud. Mm -hmm. I mean, just amazing. Just really, mm -hmm. really. We, I normally maybe take a couple of notes. It took like four sheets of paper here because mm -hmm. I'm just writing things down that are brilliant. And we've been a lot, there's been a lot of conversation in the chat. So I'm just going to echo from all my friends in the chat here how many times people said genius or brilliant about. Really, I think just simple things, backward mm -hmm. chaining. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, that is just mm -hmm. lovely. Um, all right, so one chat from Kelly was, what was the name of the app that you mentioned that gave the steps for um, doing the checklist? Oh, for that's called Goblin, like like a like a Halloween. I don't know why they call it Goblin. Goblin dot tools. T O O L S. Okay, cool. Yeah. That I found is. it in my Play Store. When you said it, I looked for it and found it in the Play Store. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I, I love it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I want it, it for myself. It I want it. several other little things it'll do too. One of the other things it'll do is it will um, formalize like an email. Mm -hmm. Like if you say, hey, yo, teacher, what grade I got? It will, <laughs> it, it will change it to... Professor, would mm -hmm. you for me? 
Nice. I've got my progress in your class. That's nice. That's nice. You know, and you know, even just like the practice on making a phone call to the school secretary, it could be with mm-hmm. anybody really, but that is just really brilliant. And I don't even think it's just for our students with special needs. Mm-hmm. It's for everybody in this a- a generation here because they're mm-hmm. so used to texting mm-hmm. that they don't know how to pick up the phone. I remember my father and mother both being really really specific and saying, when you're calling, you don't say, hi, can I talk to Linda? That was my best friend. No, no, no. Hi, Mrs. Levinson. This is Joyce. How are you today? Mm-hmm. Is Linda available to speak? Thank mm-hmm. you. I mean, like my father drilled that into us because it was that era. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't do that too well, do we? But I think just practice for just making their own appointments, going to a, mm-hmm. a adult doctor, Mm-hmm. Um, in all of those pieces, there was another app you mentioned for the pill taking strategy. I M E D I S A F E. I spelt it wrong. I'm glad I asked again. Metasafe. Good. Well, yeah, we, we take a million pills here for things too. Mm-hmm. So that's the yeah, other like I love yellow that. highlighter out, Carl. I mean, this is the <laughs> level where we're at today. <laughs> Go ahead, tell us. That one is, it, I, I put my medicine and then the dosage. And then uh, like uh, last week I went to my eye doctor and they said, are you taking any new medications? And I just handed her mm. my, <laughs> I said, I don't know. Look, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I got. I don't, what, what did you have last time? And I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Because you don't know what she had yeah. last time. You know what last time. That. This is what I've got now. Um, um, well, there was a lot of requests for a copy of the slides. So Felisa will take, uh, we can make a PDF of them as well. And that can go out with our re- our recording because we do a rec- we do an email to everybody who registered with the recording and we'll put a PDF of the slides there for them as well. Um, I don't know if I had any other, let's see. In the app store, there's a couple with that name. Is the app green or purple? Which it's app? Green. It's oh, green. The Goblin Tools. It's green. There it's you got go. a little. I'm it's sticking top. a picture in here of it. If okay. It's Does that work for you, Trudy? You can yay or nay on that. Excellent presentation. So much love. So much love. Really, just thank you so much. Uh, we truly appreciate it. And I love this closing um, comment here. So. Um, we thank you. And I'm just going to tidy things up a bit here um, just to say um, that we do uh, not only provide the, the recording and we'll do the, the slide listing here because that was just so important, but you can share that recording with anybody. Mm-hmm. So if you go to our website, educationassociates.com, look at the resources tab, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in resources, mm-hmm. but there's one that's webinar Wednesdays. And so you can tell, and so your, your colleagues, you can mm-hmm. share it with your staff. You can share it with parents. I mean, mm-hmm. there is a lot of tips that you just gave us, Carly, that mm-hmm. I would love to share with some of the parents for students that I've worked with. Mm-hmm. because they don't necessarily, if they hear it from somebody else, they'll listen. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a few things I'm going to share with my husband because I think he can <laughs> follow the checklist instead of waiting to be nagged. I love that. Nice. By the way. Verbal nice. reminder is nagging. Um, mm-hmm. So go to our website, check that out, please. There's also um, other ways that you can find out more. Somebody had asked about a list of all of those evidence-based practices that we were talking about that are included in the curriculum. You can get a preview packet and it'll show you some of the video modeling examples and some of the um, situation cards and other types of things. They're kind of all jam-packed in there. Um, there is a newsletter, News for You, and that allows you, so let's see, this is what the, the preview pack looks like. So you can click on preview pack. It's really easy to download. It's a PDF with everything. Then we have news and views, and this will kind of recap the highlights from today. So Mm -hmm. we we actually take the time to do a little quick summary. So if somebody didn't have a chance to read, to watch this, um, or if they want to know why they should watch it, they would Mm -hmm. read the recap first. So it's not a salesy kind of newsletter. It's an informative newsletter. I know many directors who um, subscribe to this and then they just forward it out to their team, you know, once a month when it comes in. So that's also um, cool. And um, 
then there's the contact us information also on our resources list. You can get a personal Zoom where we will walk you through um, the, those evidence-based practices and all of the materials, both in the project discovery, uh, job ready, and in the um, achieve life skills or I achieve for the life ready materials um, and the resources page, webinar Wednesdays. Yep. So I think that, that kind of covers it. Look how many things are out there so that you can find things just really available to you. Um, finally, and not less important, there's a link to how everything can be funded because we have learned from educators what they use. And there's, there's funding. I know everybody right now is all talking about this financial cliff because the ESSER funds are going away. Mm -hmm. We've had funds since before COVID. And those funds are still there, right? So you still have your IDEA, you still have your Carl Perkins funds, there's Title I, there's Title Three. So we'll show you how you can find them to get what you need for your kiddos. And I just can't say thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, mm -hmm. just <laughs> loved the presentation. Um, so many useful tips for all of us. We appreciate that. Appreciate everybody who came here today. Thank you all so much. We hope you have a great day. And um, we hope you join us again next month. Um, and we're really excited about that. So um, have a great day. Thank you so much. Great.